This is Duke University. This week on Office Hours, when Secretary of Homeland Security Janet Napolitano comes to campus today, she will hold a public conversation about immigration and counterterrorism with Duke professors David Shanzer and Noah Pickus. Shanzer is the director of the Triangle Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security and an associate professor of the practice in Duke's Sanford School of Public Policy. Pickus is the Nanerl O. Cohan director of Duke's Keenan Institute for Ethics and author of True Faith and Allegiance, Immigration and American Civic Nationalism, Becoming American, America Becoming. Shanzer and Pickus take your questions on citizenship and security. Hi, welcome to Office Hours. My name is Tia Brueggemann. I'm a master's student here at Duke and a production assistant for the Office of News and Communications. I'm here today with Professor um, Noah Pickus and Professor David Shanzer, who later this evening will be hosting a public conversation with Secretary of Homeland Security Janet Napolitano. But first, they'll be here, um, excuse me, that's airing at 5.30 p.m. on Ustream. But first, they're here with us today to discuss citizenship and security. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Thank happy to be here. And so um, to start us off, can you just tell us a little bit about the event tonight? Well, we're very excited to have a cabinet secretary uh, coming to visit Duke. Uh, and she's agreed, uh, really, this is, I think, she's done a series of campus speeches uh, around the country. Uh, but this is the first time that I'm aware of she's uh, going to engage in actual uh, give and take uh, uh, with uh, us for the entire uh, time, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. So uh, we're really looking forward to the opportunity to ask a cabinet secretary questions tonight. Great. And what does this mean for the Duke community? What does this mean for our students? Well, they're going to have an opportunity to meet with someone who's been a governor of a major border state and is overseeing one of the more complicated, complex federal agencies today on a uh, you can't pick more complicated issues than security and immigration that she's dealing with, and they'll have a chance for really to engage with her. Sure. And speaking of Secretary Napolitano, we actually have a video clip of her here speaking on the anniversary of 9-11 about what we as citizens can do and what our part is in all of this. So let's take a look. Our experience these last 10 years also reminds us that our homeland security begins with hometown security that it's a shared responsibility, and that we all have a role to play. Time and again, we've seen terrorist attacks thwarted by alert individuals who said something to local authorities when they saw something that didn't seem right. So this idea of see something, say something, is this effective? Well, I think it's important, and I'm going to talk to her about that uh, uh, this evening, I hope. Uh, it's an interesting concept because um, People pay their taxes uh, for a lot for the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, our Constitution, the preamble of the Constitution says that uh, a key reason that we even have a federal government is to provide for the common defense. So I think most individuals think that that's a governmental responsibility, that the, they should be able to go about their lives and, and be secure. And Secretary Napolitano's uh, uh, message is that to get as even more secure than the government can provide. We actually need communities and individuals uh, to, to be involved and, and be able to uh, have a trusting relationship with law enforcement that they can bring things of serious attention uh, you know, so they, they can find them and, and thwart them before they occur. Sure. And when you're talking about all this, I mean, is there a balance then between the see something, say something and civil liberties? Well, absolutely. Uh, some worry that see something, say something sounds like 1984 or that we're in a surveillance society. Uh, uh, you want to love thy neighbor, not necessarily be suspicious uh, of everything that they do. And it even raises a deeper issue uh, because uh, some of the things that people might see and say, think to themselves, well, that must mean that person is a terrorist are the very things that are protected by our Constitution, like freedom of religion, freedom of expression. Uh, somebody could say things that are critical of U.S. foreign policy, or maybe even say things that uh, Muslims are not treated fairly across the globe. Uh, other people might take that as saying, oh, well, that person must believe the same things Osama bin Laden does. So those are protected constitutional liberties. Those people have a right to say those types of things. Uh, so where do you draw the line between what is protected and should not become 
uh, part of uh, a scrutiny of law enforcement. And the, the desire, people like Secretary Napolitano, to find people who are heading towards radicalization and are going to engage in violence, you want to find them beforehand. So I think that's a very hard line to draw, and I'm going to ask her about that tonight. And actually, speaking of this, Professor Shanzer, you are um, the director of the Triangle Center of Terrorism and Homeland Security, and your group has uh, put out numerous studies on these ideas of homegrown terrorism. And um, can you tell us what you found in those studies about radicalization? Well, the first thing that we have had to do to do this study and, and make some sense of it is try to get a sense of how big of a problem it was. Uh, before we had done that, nobody had really put together all of the data. And the first thing we found is that it's a problem, but it's, uh, it, it's one of small scope. So over the decades since 9-11, uh, we have identified uh, less than 200, so about 20 per year or less, uh, individuals, uh, Muslim Americans, who have been arrested uh, for engaging in some sort of violent or engaged in the incident themselves. Uh, or third, joined a foreign fighting force. Uh, so if you compare that to the 15,000 murders that take place in the United States every year, uh, you have to say it's still a problem, because if 20 people had successfully engaged in a terrorist incident every year, that would be a big deal. Uh, but you also have to kind of keep it in context, and it is, it is a very small sliver of the Muslim American community that is attracted to this ideology and uh, plots or engages in, in violence. So that's our first finding. Our second finding was that the Muslim American community uh, itself, uh, the vast majority uh, of those, whether they're immigrants or have lived in this country for uh, generations, uh, are adamantly against this ideology and they're taking actions within their own communities to try to prevent individuals uh, in them from engaging in violence. And then that uh, uh, spans from things like making sure that radical speakers are not given a platform in their mosque to community building uh, uh, activities so that individuals don't fall through the cracks and, and uh, get on a bad track in their life. So there are a lot of things that Muslim American communities are doing to prevent that. We identify a lot of ideas about other things that they could do to be more effective, but those are the main results of our study. And speaking of this, we saw uh, where just a few days ago there were three men right here in North Carolina um, who were found guilty of uh, conspiring with t terrorism related uh, activities. Has, has there been any fallout from that that you see at your center or just? Well, uh, this case was broke in 2009, uh, actually, as we were putting together our report, which came out uh, <laughs> a couple of months later. So we actually focused on that a, a bit. And this was a cell uh, uh, which had a ringleader, uh, a guy named Daniel Boyd. And uh, he was a, a white uh, American, born an American citizen. So one thing that shows is that you can't tell from looking at an individual whether they are even a potentially uh, going to head towards this path of uh, violent extremism or not. Uh, so he was the ringleader and he'd been involved in a lot of kind of these nefarious activities for a while. He'd spent some time in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, apparently he was under surveillance for quite some time before he was arrested in 2009. And he and his associates, uh, unfortunately his two younger sons, uh, and then some other young Muslim men in the neighborhood, uh, he had cached a large stockpile of weapons and was surveilled talking about potential uh, terrorist activities both uh, abroad and ultimately he had done some surveillance on the Quantico uh, base in, in Virginia. Uh, he pled guilty and then, uh, as did his two sons, to some very serious charges. And the question was with these three uh, young men, were they part of the conspiracy or not? Uh, had they crossed the line into being considered you know, having engaged in a plan to conduct terrorism. They claim they were innocent bystanders. They were just looking at uh, uh, videos on the website and they hadn't taken any active engagement and therefore should not be convicted. Uh, the jury didn't see it that way. And so uh, they were all convicted of conspiracy charges. And one of, some of them I think got material support for terrorism and their sentencing uh, will happen in another couple of months. 
So it uh, was a, certainly a sad uh, episode for the Muslim American community in, in Raleigh, uh, shocking, I think, uh, for them. And I think disappointment that these three young men are going to spend a significant amount of time in jail. Yes. Well, Professor Pickus, um, we actually have a clip of you here um, speaking at the 10th anniversary of 9-11, and um, you're talking about the changes in the immigration debate. And so let's take a, a look at that together. We used to have an immigration and naturalization service that was originally in the Department of Labor. Then it was moved over the years to the Department of Justice. Now, because of 9-11, it is in the Department of Homeland Security. It is part of an enforcement operation, not a justice or a labor operation. So immigration now in the Department of Homeland Security, I mean, that's, that's big. Can you talk about that, elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I think you can see in that historical story, um, I mean, immigration is about security. It's also about justice, and it's also about labor and commerce. And we don't quite know where to put it. We keep moving it around, and we emphasize one thing or another. Even within Homeland Security, Secretary Napolitano has a real challenge because part of her immigration responsibility is enforcement is in keeping out certain kind of migrants, whether simply illegal immigrants coming for work or uh, uh, terrorists. And on the other hand, she's responsible for helping people get into the U.S. legally to come in and even to become citizens. And you can imagine that that's a divided kind of mandate to both keep out and to bring in and a complicated one to, to carry out. And historically, the emphasis has often been more on enforcement than on welcoming. They've made a lot of strides to work on that and to build a greater focus on naturalization and citizenship. But they have a very difficult task just managing the in enforcement side. Sure. And you both know this is a, a live show, and we've got um, questions coming in from our viewers at home. So let's go ahead and take one of them. Um, our first question comes from our viewer, May. She asks... What role can foreign-born nationals who come to the United States in pursuit of higher education play in strengthening the American economy and upholding the American dream? When there is so much talk of immigrants stealing jobs, what kind of immigration reform would allow the U.S. to capitalize on the talents and good intentions of most foreign college or graduate students? So something that might affect even some of our students here at Duke. What are, what are your thoughts? Well, one of the central issues that points to is that we... We make our immigration policy every 20 or 30 years in these big, great generational heaves. And the last time we made that policy, in particular back in the 1960s, we moved away from discriminatory ethnic quotas toward an emphasis on family reunification, which is obviously a bedrock principle. But what that has turned out to mean is that it's very hard to legally come into the country and stay if you don't have a close family tie. And that happens to mean a lot of skilled workers find it hard to come in. And one of the uh, tricky challenges that we face is how to tilt our immigration policy more towards skilled visas, skilled immigrants who are contributing in this way, while at the same time maintaining a commitment to some dimension of family reunification. We have to balance those values in a way right now that are out of whack. If I can make a, a sure. point uh, on that, uh, you know, economically, obviously, we're hitting hard times, but many other countries are uh, around the globe as well. And if we look at a place like Japan, it's really had a long, stagnating uh, a period of economic uh, troubles. And most people think that Japan is headed for uh, an even longer period because its population is aging uh, uh, at a very rapid rate. Uh, but what distinguishes us from Japan, actually, and we have an aging population as well, but it's young immigrants uh, who are coming to the country, growing our uh, population, and contributing to dynamism and economic growth uh, that actually is helping our long-term economic prospects in compar compared to a place like Japan. So most Americans, all or many Americans, see a lot of difficulty with immigration and think it's an economic drag, but actually the 
the influx of immigrants and then the fact that they will pay into the social security system. If they're 20, they'll pay in for 40 years uh, uh, until they start drawing out uh, is a very uh, important uh, story to understand that that's part of our economic future and what is giving us economic uh, optimism as opposed to you know, pessimism. And you bring up a really good comparative perspective. And actually, that was going to be my, my next question um, for Professor Pickus. In your book, True Faith and Allegiance, you compare your, your European immigration to American immigration. And you say, in contrast to Europe, the US civic national approach allows citizens to maintain their ethnic and religious identities and their national identities, albeit not without tensions and difficult choices, which makes it easier for immigrants to see themselves as loyal and patriotic Americans. So can you, can you talk about that pers comparative perspective a little bit? Look, all, all immigration is hard. It, it's hard on the individuals involved. It's uprooting. It's dislocating. Even when it turns out to be a good story and a happy family story, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And it's hard on societies, too. It's just, we were just talking yesterday with my class about West Side Story, <laughs> right? West Side Story is about turf battles between new and old immigrant groups. And none of this is easy, and we don't do ourselves a favor if we suggest that it is. But historically, it has, Europe has been having a much harder trouble with incorporating immigrants because they haven't, they've thought of themselves as countries of emigration where they send immigrants out, mm -hmm. not as places to which immigrants come to. So Turk, Turks coming to Germany, for instance, and being there for generations and not being able to access citizenship, or definitions of identity in Europe which are often tighter and based on, on blood and on a, uh, a, a sense of identity which doesn't include in it the idea that people can join up and it would be something different. So we have a lot of tensions and conflicts over what it means to be an American but it's been a 200 plus year debate that immigrants contribute to rather than a, a, a category mistake, which is the way it's been often posed in Europe. I see. And Professor Pickus, you are the, um, the director of the Keenan Institute for Ethics, and your group has done a lot of work right here in Durham um, with the Bhutanese um, resettlement project. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Um, there's even a documentary made on it. And what has that experience been like? Well, so the, the Bhutanese are, um, have been, um, some of you may know the Kingdom of Bhutan, which is known for its gross domestic happiness quotient. Um, that's how they measure uh, success. But one of the less successful aspects has been uh, expelling uh, members of the community who have various differences and who have been living in refugee camps for as much as 18 years in Nepal. India would not take them in. Nepal has let them stay but has not uh, absorbed them. And the U.S., which uh, although it lets in, you might say, only 80,000 refugees a year, nonetheless lets in more refugees than any other country in the world, um, has recently committed to taking more uh, of the Bhutanese refugees, and North Carolina turns out to be one of the three major sites in the United States where they're coming. And this is a particularly uh, challenging uh, refugee relocation in that when you think about Durham and, Nor and Duke's involvement, there's often a sort of sense of, well, we have issues here and there are issues there. There are issues abroad. But this is a circumstance where there are, our students have been over in Nepal, in the refugee camps, working with the refugees, documenting their oral histories, and then helping them to try and resettle here. And these are refugees who often come from a farming community, from, uh, who have illiterate literacy in their community, and suddenly drop down in the middle of North Carolina. I mean, I came from California, <laughs> and I found it a little hard to get adjusted. You can imagine this. And okay. so this is part of a larger effort at the Keenan Institute 
to look at and to directly address questions of migration and relocation, which raise everything from practical issues of how do I find a school and how do I navigate a supermarket to what does it mean to for my community to be uprooted and to be here when we used to be there, and how should federal policy and local resettlement agencies deal with these very difficult issues. And do you find that your students come back with a totally different viewpoint or different uh, attitude towards immigration? Have you noticed that? I don't think they come back with a totally different attitude. I think they come back um, with a sense of how complex and difficult this is and that the easy answers of, well, we should just absorb everybody who wants to come or we should just keep people out um, don't really address the competing obligations we have in our principles, in our country's history, and in the local dynamics, which are very complicated. We have members of our community asking, why are we putting so much into the resettlement of these refugees we've never heard of before? What about our needs? What about those of us not doing well here in Durham? And that's a microcosm of the larger debate that we've been talking about today. Well, we have another question here um, via email. This one comes from Chris. He describes a situation whereby his wife of eight years is about to be deported in January, and he asks why nothing has been done to protect American citizens' interests in immigration matters of the immediate family members. Well, I'm not sure about the specifics of um, immediate family members' interests, but one of the things that David and I will be talking with Secretary Napolitano about tonight is precisely this balance between uh, increased efforts on the part of Department of Homeland of the Department of Homeland Security to have more effective deportation policies, which they are trying to focus on what they consider criminal aliens. Um, and they've just announced yesterday, I think it was, that they've had a record number of deportations, almost 400,000. And so they're both trying to step up enforcement of the law, and at the same time they're getting criticism from two sides. One side, like your uh, uh, caller or your emailer or your IMer, um, <laughs> it, uh, may be indicating the extent to which this seems much too um, broad a category, and that people who are caught up in minor traffic violations or other aspects are being swept up in this deport deportation. But the secretary has to balance that also against those who say this is a much too narrow focus on those who have already committed crimes when there are already so many people here who are unauthorized. So um, I feel, as we all do for the caller and the individuals in these circumstances, but that's the larger policy dynamic that the secretary is trying to balance. Well, if you have any questions of your own um, for, for Professor Pickus or Professor Shanzer, please feel free to email us at live at duke.edu or contact us via Twitter. So we've got another question that's come in from Anthony. And um, Anthony writes, in his opinion piece, Dr. Shanzer suggests reframing the current war on terror into a fight between people of all faiths and those who seek to impose an archaic intolerance theocracy on others. No doubt this approach would be a substantial improvement but it seems almost impossible to achieve given the, given the domestic, political, and economic climate. It's a little bit long. The threat of the heathen outsider resonates with a large part of the American populace and has proven to be an almost irresistible button for a certain slice of our political spectrum. What steps can be taken to change the environment here in the U.S. to one that is more amenable to this type of policy? Okay, well, that's a mouthful from <laughs> Anthony, mouthful. but uh, I understand his, uh, his, uh, his larger point. And, uh, well, we've had a 10-year debate uh, about rhetoric. It was even controversial when President Obama said he was not going to use the terminology war on terror anymore to describe our counterterrorism policies, but uh, war against al-Qaeda. And that was a desire to try to focus on who, were, who was the real enemy, who were the, creating these problems. Uh, not that the war on terror was designed to say, well, terrorists are the problems. Uh, but the problem is that had a lot of baggage and it was seemed like we were uh, picking and choosing among terrorists and it turned out it was mostly Muslim groups that were being targeted uh, by us. So that took on a lot of baggage in terms of uh, uh, maybe too broadly framing 
who the enemy was. And President Obama has tried to uh, uh, focus uh, that a little bit more. Uh, I try to use in, in my rhetoric, and I think others should as well, uh, to try to better understand and educate the American public. Um, unfortunately, uh, really, uh, over the past decade, there's been a growth of misunderstanding uh, about Islam uh, and almost a alternative version that has taken root in uh, some segments of the American uh, public uh, saying that Islam is an inherently violent religion and that it condones, even commands, certain types of acts uh, to be taken, which is not true. Uh, yet a lot of people believe that. So I just think it's incumbent upon all of our public figures, our leaders, whether they be in the government or uh, in the broader community, to uh, better identify who is causing the terrorism and why they're doing it. It's not uh, because of Islam, it's because of they have a, a broader uh, political agenda that they are, are promoting and to try to be very careful about the words we use and, and the way we describe this conflict. We have another question here. It says, how does the death of Muammar Gaddafi affect national security interests of the United States? Well, uh, when I came in, it was still unconfirmed whether he was captured or dead, but uh, either way, uh, it is a good thing when a uh, tyrannical dictator is essentially taken out of power and he's been out of power now for a number of months, uh, but now he's no longer in a position where uh, the Libyan people uh, will, are going to be fearing him. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Iraq was, didn't know where Saddam was for uh, nine months or so after the, uh, the fall of his government, and, and people thought that was something that uh, inhibited the Iraqis from maybe moving on. Uh, so the Libyan people will be able to move on. They're celebrating now. Uh, and the, it'll be very interesting to see the steps that they take to try to form a, a, a new and better uh, inclusive government that can actually engage uh, with the world. Gaddafi led an a incredibly isolated and intolerant and dictatorial regime. So it's a good thing that he's no longer in, in a place where he can uh, influence people and, and terrorize them. And how do you think this will affect the terrorist threat to the United States? Uh, well, I don't think it has a, a, an immediate cause and effect, uh, but I think one thing we can look at is how we engaged in this particular conflict. President Obama was uh, criticized a great deal from so-called leading from behind, from not putting a, uh, some argued that, well, we shouldn't even be in Libya at all, and some argued that well, if we're going to be there, we have to make sure we win, and we have to be out in front, and we have to be the ones who are leading the charge. And uh, I give a lot of credit to President Obama uh, for the way we did this, uh, because if you compare it to Iraq, uh, where, yes, this was an American invasion, and then, of course, we had an American occupation, uh, those things actually helped produce a counterinsurgency within the country uh, that led to... Uh, you know, thousands of deaths of, of our soldiers. It led to literally millions of people uh, being displaced. And I'm not saying Iraq is an equivalency to uh, Libya, but certainly it's better if we have a essentially a homegrown insurgency to take care of these uh, dictators uh, that uh, we think have good intentions about uh, the shape of their future government. And if they're the ones who can take down the dictator, uh, and, and not an American or a Western force. So I think it could contribute to the dynamic of terrorism, which is what your question is, by uh, maybe we can pursue our counterterrorism objectives, uh, but do so in a way that we are working in combination with uh, uh, other Muslims or in other countries with uh, those uh, uh, people who are on the ground and whose country it really is, uh, and that they can take ownership over this problem. We'd love to see Pakistan uh, doing that uh, more. So I think in that way, the way the Libyan conflict came about and the way Gaddafi has been toppled, that we were assisting, we were a big part of it, but it was the inherent indigenous people who were uh, the public face and who are really responsible. That can be good for our counterterrorism in the long term. 
And we have another question that's come in here from Kathy. She says, I travel a lot in Europe, Middle East, and it seems that there's a TSA procedures at big airports that are so much more efficient and streamlined than others. People don't wait forever. There are multiple lines. You don't have to take off your shoes. Children, old, old ladies aren't strip shirts. You get the idea. Are there any plans for improving the efficiency and accuracy of our system to equal that of the UK, Israel? Well, um, UK or Israel. I... I I haven't been to the UK for a while, so I can't say exactly what the procedures are there. Uh, uh, Israel is really, we like to compare what happens in Israel and what happens in the United States, but we have to understand that Israel has one international uh, airport uh, with, uh, that is much, much smaller than many of our international airports. So the practices that they engage in in Israel uh, and the cost uh, and the expertise necessary to do, uh, they really have a very individualized approach where they're looking at peoples and behaviors uh, rather than kind of the mass uh, uh, processing of individuals through a security checkpoint. Um, I like the Israeli approach, but I understand, uh, and Secretary Napolitano has said, you know, you need to th do things that are scalable in a country of uh, uh, 300 million people with uh, hundreds of thousands of travelers uh, every day coming through. It's a different type of uh, thing. Uh, I think the only way we're going to really see changes is through advances in technology. I understand that you know, people are working on uh, detection devices that uh, can uh, help uh, let us keep our shoes on. Uh, that would be an improvement. Uh, but I don't foresee any uh, significant changes in the way we're doing things other than new technologies being deployed. And to go back to the immigration um, debate a bit, so in Alabama there's of course very controversial uh, immigration policies. We've seen some pushback by that, for that, by the Justice Department. Um, can you talk a little bit about that situation, what you've seen there? Yeah, or if I can widen the frame just a little bit. Of course. Um, and uh, partly as a, as a teaser for this evening with the Secretary, <laughs> there's um, what's happening in Alabama is an example of uh, states across the country reacting in different ways to immigration being a federal responsibility. But the frustration at the state level with the inability uh, in Congress to uh, agree on policies and actually implement them that would not me make the uh, downstream effect on hospitals and schools and communities uh, locally so significant. And so the Alabama has moved toward what some are calling the most restrictive effort uh, in, in the country toward um, uh, to identify um, uh, people who are here illegally uh, and to have the active engagement of uh, state and local officials. And there's been a, uh, a ruling uh, in Alabama that lets some of these provisions go forward and some are on hold because they're said to take over the authority that's genuinely the federal government's. And so you have a lot of controversy there of uh, immigrant families keeping their kids out of school for fear of what's happening, and there's a great deal of consternation over that. It's part of a larger effort that goes by the uh, phrase attrition through enforcement, that if we simply enforced our laws, we, won't, we don't have to deport everybody. People will voluntarily remove themselves. And you can contrast that with states like California, which just a week ago signed into law, Governor Jerry Brown signed into law what they're calling the California Dream Act, which makes it easier financially for people who are uh, undocumented to, for the children of undocumented workers, to, uh, to go to post high school uh, education. And so you have efforts across the landscape that are really a patchwork of being more generous or being more restrictive, and we're seeing quite a sense of experimentation, uh, and we don't know how that's going to play out. Well, some very interesting things to discuss this evening with Secretary Napolitano. So as we wrap up, can you just tell us what you hope to get from the event this evening, or can you give us any sort of preview of tonight? 
Well, I, I think the best thing that we could achieve is for people to gain an understanding, uh, first of all, of the complexity and the difficulty and how all of these issues, uh, if there were easy answers, then they wouldn't be controversial. Uh, but there aren't any easy answers. So what I'd like uh, in my questions, I'm going to try to get the secretary to show us how it is that she tries to balance uh, values like liberty and security. Uh, how she makes decisions about how we decide, well, is it more important to secure the airports or more important to secure the borders uh, when we're living in an era of restrained uh, resources? Uh, and uh, so I'd like, I'd like people to get a sense of that. And the other thing, I'd like them to uh, get to see uh, uh, a genuine public official who's had such a rich experience being a governor, a uh, U.S. attorney, uh, and, and now a secretary of a cabinet agency, uh, try to get to know her maybe as a, as a real person uh, as opposed to somebody they just read about in the newspapers. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for being on the show. I know I'll be one of the students in the front of the line tonight trying to get to the event. And thank you at, at home all for watching Office Hours. And be sure to tune in tonight at 5.30 p.m. here on Ustream to watch uh, Secretary of Homeland Security Janet Napolitano. And a recording of, um, of, off of this video of Office Hours, along with many of our other videos, are available on Duke On Demand.